Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted a feel better body, mind, and soul, then do we have the Manifesting Your Greatest Self show for you. Today I'll be talking with repeat New York Times best-selling author Nick Ortner, CEO of The Tapping Solution and the author of a brilliant book for tapping your way to a new you, The Tapping Solution for Manifesting Your Greatest Self. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about one of the most powerful tools for changing your life and how to release self-doubt, cultivate inner peace, and create a life you love. That plus we'll talk about letting go of chickens and eggs, what in the world is suds, who in the world are Grog and Thor, the power of positive eudaimonio demons, Michael Jordan and his shorts, a hundred pound wallet, and what in the world a big book of hugs has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Nick. Are you ready to shine? I am ready to go. Thank you for having me, Michael. Thank you so much for being here and a mighty woohoo! So before we dive right into things, where did you spend your earliest years before you came to Connecticut? Oh, great question. So I was actually born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, which mm -hmm. you wouldn't know since my accent has, uh, I was seven years old when I moved here. So uh, no accent, but I'm bilingual. I was born in Argentina, lived there until right, I turned eight just when I got here to the US and moved to yeah. Connecticut. Um, so it was Argentina for almost eight years then Connecticut and, you know, a little jumps into New York City and California along the way, but I now live in Connecticut. Awesome. And what was your early childhood like? You know, it's such a good question. It's an interesting um, experience for me in that since I had that break at, you know, right coming to second grade, mm -hmm. my memories of before then, I believe are subtler or less concrete than most people's would be, right? And I think that what happened is, you know, when you stay in one place and, you know, at least even at least one language, you have reminders and of the place, right? So if I had lived there my whole life, I would walk by the school that I went to when I was in second grade. Since I stopped doing that, my memories are vaguer. They're very happy memories. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, those early years are, I think there's less there than might be if I had been in one location. Now, when I came, you know, to show the opposite of that, and of course I was older, when I came to the U.S., my memories were very strong of that. Um, my first experience, and it's something that I, I write about in the book and I've tapped on since, one of my <laughs> early experiences in the U.S. was a quote-unquote negative one. I was at a school where I was going to be for a couple months. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly why, but I was miserable. I'm sure it had something to do with not speaking the language, something to do with feeling like an outcast and whatever had happened in that space. And, um, you know, I tell the story in the book about locking myself in the car. Um, uh, my poor great aunt driving me to school, she steps out of the car and I lock myself in boom, 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 you know, not automatic locks. Like, you know, this is 1987, right? So yep. all the locks and I'm like, Nope, I'm not going to school. So, you know, certainly an awareness there that it was not a fun, pleasant experience for me. Fortunately, when we moved to the town that I eventually lived in for, you know, 25 years, everything changed. It was just a more welcoming group. I'm sure my English was better and I could fit in more. And then those were much happier memories. Like anything, you know, um, the challenges that we have growing up. But I, I've certainly been blessed with, you know, security in terms of uh, finances and being middle class growing up and just, you know, being comfortable, not rich and certainly downtimes, but you know, I, nothing to complain about and then having a great education and most importantly, kind, loving parents. So, um, you know, I, I had a lovely upbringing. Awesome. And, and one of the things I've got to give kudos to your mom is she had a secret stash of somebody's audio tapes. Yeah. That's Tony Robbins. And, uh, she definitely bought him on TV. Mm -hmm. Um, she, you know, Probably late night, saw him running his infomercials, which ran and probably are still running somewhere for decades. And uh, it was probably in high school where I picked up the, the tapes and started listening and started feeding that in into my brain, which is, you know, that's why your podcast is so important. That's why all this work is so valuable. When we're feeding our brain, when we're putting this good information in, it's almost guaranteed to have good things come out. You know, one of the things that I, I really credit two things to my personal happiness, fulfillment, and joy today. One is tapping, which we'll get into. But the second one is, no matter what it was, just putting that information in my ears. And it hasn't changed. I have my phone full of podcasts 
always feeding my brain with that positive information. And that's how it started with the tape decks with Tony Robbins. Um, you know, listening, getting insights, starting to recognize, I think one of the big things that Tony does for so many people is that he makes us aware that we're actually in control of our own lives and of mm -hmm. how we feel, which once you know that, it seems kind of obvious, but most of the world is walking around not feeling in control of how they feel, not feeling like they can affect their reality, right? They just think the world that happens to them and how they feel is just the way it's supposed to be. So if we're angry, it's because it's justified and normal and it's because something was done to us. Tony started making me think otherwise and uh, it was probably five or six years after that that I went to one of his live events and you know, as, as the world turns a decade later, got to spend time with him and uh, he supported the Tapping Solution Foundation and it's an honor to call him a friend, which is the coolest thing ever from those tapes, you know, like awesome. listening to those tapes and then spending time with him. It's like, okay, this worked, right? I'm doing something right along the way to get to that point. And, and I, like I said, I think it really has to do with like, what are we putting in these earbuds? Like that makes a difference. The more you fill, fill your mind, it's almost inevitable, right? That if you're just, if you're just on the couch and you're depressed and you just can't get up, like... If you listen to all, how many episodes do you have now, Michael? I saw that uh, there's 700 and this will be probably like 715. Fine. So let's do one a day, 715, two years straight of listening yep. to one episode a day. Even if you tried, you couldn't help but be a different person at the end of those mm -hmm. two years. And you would literally have to do nothing else, right? You wouldn't even have to take action on the things because you would naturally, all right? You would just like, oh, try this and try that. There, there would be no forcing. You put it in your brain, other stuff's going to come out. So it's beautiful. I can remember back in the day having my personal power collection from Tony yeah. Robbins on cassette, of course, and, and everything from the Nightingale Conant collections and, and uh, Stephen Covey and everybody. Look, the, the Nightingale Conant stuff, I, you, know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They're rectangular sort of mm -hmm. holders for them, right? They're the binders and they sit on the, and that was my dad. My mom did Tony Robbins. My dad was a Nightingale Conan guy. And I can even, I can even remember the feel of opening the plastic, you know, cause oh, kinda, yeah. it's kind of stuck together a little and bit. And they it's, pop open. They pop open, right? And you've got the tapes that you also sometimes have to pry those tapes out of there, you know, yep. Nightingale Conan, 100%. I mean, that is the stuff that, you know, transforms lives. Yeah. So it's, it's fascinating. If we fast forward a little bit, it's interesting that there can be these sticking points in life when we're doing all the work, or mm, chances are we've forgotten about a lot of the work, but we're maybe doing a little bit of it, mm. but we get stuck. And for you, I think that was mid-20s in real estate. Yeah, no, I think you nailed it. Um, you know, the time, I think if, we, if I look at that time period, it's a time where the information has been going in, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm listening to Tony, I'm attending his events. Um, and then you look at the outer circumstances and it's like, wait, it's like half working, right? So yeah. it's like works for a little bit and then it falls apart or that's not working at all. So there was a lot of, you know, what I call boom bust cycles. Like that was a great year or a great six months. Oh, it all fell apart, <laughs> you know, and it just <laughs> happens again and again. And I think there were a couple of things happening there. One, there is an element of just patience, right? That these are the things that are going to happen that mm -hmm. if you listen to, you know, Tony Robbins today or this podcast today, or you do the tapping today, it's not that tomorrow everything can change. Though it can. And certainly one of the things that I loved about tapping is how quickly it can change your state. But there's that delay, right? There's that delay where, you know, if I'm running a real estate company, I was buying, fixing up and selling properties. It takes time to get out of that, right? It takes time for another opportunity to appear. You could be at your quote unquote miserable dead end job for three years doing all the right things for your brain, getting this information and in, making those better life choices. But you know what? It may be three years before you get to that point where that other fork in the road happens, where that other opportunity happens. Um, we, you know, we tend to want everything to be figured out immediately. And the idea of when we find our purpose, it's going to be tomorrow where we drop everything and, you know, the skies open up and the heavens, the, the angels sing and uh, it, it all happens. And I didn't find that to be the case. My 20s were that, was that time when I was doing the work, not getting the results that I wanted, but it was that mm -hmm. perseverance and that element of going, okay, so I'm putting this stuff in my brain, right? I'm yeah. doing that step of it. And if I'm not getting the outcome I want, why is that? What patterns of thinking 
am I running that even with this input, maybe they're changing, but they're not changing as quickly as I want them to be, or I'm, or I'm keeping that limited scope, right? Yeah, I think I'm doing it, but am I really doing it? I think I'm being productive, but am I really being productive? Um, I think I'm all lined up, but I'm sabotaging myself. So that's where that deeper inquiry process, like what, what do I believe about the world? Even with putting this good information, what do I believe about myself? What things happened to me in the last 20 years that might be guiding my behavior and decisions today? And it was really in my 20s when I sort of really doubled down on that exploratory process. So thank you for sharing. And, and you doubled down on it and you dove in. It sounds like you discovered tapping and, and you're going to have to share, of course, what tapping is, but you discovered it and that helped you to dive deep and helped you with that inquiry process. Well, 100%. And that's it. And, you know, for people who, who are joining us and think that we're talking about tap dancing and are getting very lost, you know, uh, tapping. <laughs> Which would be fun. It would be fun. Hey, whatever works, right? If, if tap dancing cleared limiting beliefs, I would get into it. Um, we are call it tapping because we are physically, and if you're just listening to the podcast, I'm taking two fingers and I'm tapping physically on these endpoints of meridians of our body. And what the latest research is showing is that when we do this, we send a calming signal to the amygdala in the brain. Mm -hmm. We are, in essence, telling our brain that fight or flight response that it's safe. You talked about that inquiry process. If you don't have a tool, whether it be tapping or meditation or exercise and yoga or whatever process, journaling, to be able to do that inquiry and to move through it, it can be really mm -hmm. frustrating, right? So if you're angry at your family, at the world, at life, and you don't have a tool to move through that anger, then it's kind of like, all right, I'm just going to ignore this. Why do this deeper inquiry when I'm just getting more mad? And then one of the things about the tapping process that people initially can struggle with is they say, okay, but why are we looking at all this negative stuff? Like you're bringing up these negative things. You're talking about the anger, talking about the anxiety. They say, hey, I watched The Secret. They told me to be all positive and think happy thoughts. I'm all about that. I think the best, the best explanation for why we do this negative mm -hmm. inquiry is what my friend Louise Hayes said, the dearly departed. She just passed away a few months ago. Many of your listeners are really familiar with Louise Hay House, her work, You Can Heal Your Life. We were talking about tapping, and I said, Louise, you're the queen of affirmations, right? Queen of positive thinking. And here we are tapping. We we're tapping on a childhood trauma that she had. Like, So why are we looking at this? And she said something that I think about every, every single day. She said, honey, if you want to clean a house, you have to see the dirt. Mm -hmm. And that to me, just it was like, that's when the heavens opened. I said, yeah, let's not swallow down this dirt. And we're not doing it to anchor it in. We're not doing it to be negative people. We're doing, okay, there's dirt in that corner. So we're going to clean it. Like, let's look at it, clean it. And then that positive, inspired person can come forth naturally, right? Inspire Nation not to force it, but because, and, and you said it before we talked, you, you gave me a little background on yourself. You said you just have this thing within you, right, that mm -hmm. is just like, I want to motivate and inspire people. It comes naturally. You don't have to wake up in the morning and force yourself to do it. You don't have to be in the mirror and say positive affirmations. You can say them if you want, but they're natural. They're not forced. And I think that's what happens when you look at the dirt, when you clear out the things from the past, then you wake up with that joy and that freedom. <laughs> There's, I, I've used tapping for a few years. It's to me one of the most single most important and powerful tools out there. When I describe it to my clients, I use a very simple term that you may have used yourself, which is short circuiting. Yeah. By giving the most negative triggering thought possible yep. and then going to those points to soothe the nervous system, we short it out. We short it out. And it's crazy and it's crazy what happens that, you know, if I'm dealing with somebody with anger, it's like we want to go there. I'm so angry. We want to speak our truth. I mean, that's part of this process, too. We are so good at bearing our emotions and repressing everything that just saying, you know what, I'm angry and taking not an hour, taking a few minutes to say, this is the truth of how I feel. I'm going to feel it and I'm going to you set it perfectly short circuit it. Stop that brain pattern. And you know, but if people haven't experienced it, it's the weirdest thing. It's still weird to me a decade later that I can be upset or stressed and overwhelmed and I can go through this process and then next thing I know, I just don't care. It's like it moves away. Some people describe it as like, you know, if you're angry, you feel it in your body or you can grab onto it. But then when you tap, you're like, why are we even talking about this? I can't even, 
I can't even connect to what it was I was feeling before. Yeah. What's, what's an MPI? MPI. So that's one of the ways that I like to start tapping. And there's many approaches, right? Um, the MPI is the most pressing issue. It's like, what's the thing that's weighing you down right now? You know, we all have a thing that we can go, and sometimes it's a lifelong thing, and sometimes it's a last week thing. So we can mm -hmm. say, you know, over the last week, this thing is just like, it's taking my energy. It's sapping my energy. It's what I'm stressed out about. It's what I'm overwhelmed about. Most pressing issue. This is the thing that's bearing down on you. Something from the past, something you're doing today, something from the, for the future. You know, you might have a speech that you have to give in six months, and you're nervous about it, and guess what? That's your MPI, and for six mm -hmm. months, Unless you do something about it before that point, you're going to feel that stress, you're going to feel that overwhelm, and it's going to press on you, right? What we want to do is lighten the load. You know, with tapping, we can go deep, we can address old traumas, we can clean up the past, we can rewrite these patterns. I like to start by finding some relief because many of us just don't have the energy to do this work. You're like, mm -hmm. look, I'm just trying to keep up with my day. Nonetheless, like go back 20 years and figure out what happened there and clean it. So MPI... How do we get that breathing room? How do we calm that panic and that stress response to the place where we can then find a little space to do that deeper work? Thank you. Would you mind walking us through the basic steps, from, you know, starting with focusing on the MPI, measuring intensity? Take us through that real quickly. Let's do it. And everyone at home, do this. This is, you know, we've been talking about it and Michael's excited and I'm excited. We both know this works. But the best part about this is that you don't have to believe us. You can have an experience right now. So step one, let's pick that MPI for you. You might be anxious about something. You might be angry. Maybe you're overwhelmed. If you have physical pain in your body, tapping is super powerful for that. Pick that now. Pick a thing that you're like, you know what? If five minutes from now this was gone or I felt less stress about it, you would be happy. Right? Pick a target. That is your MPI. And just take a moment to tune into it. And as you tune in, give it a number on a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being the most intense, the most pressing, 0 being it's not there. You know, you want to pick something 5 or higher, ideally. Right? So we have our target and we have our yeah. number. And it's always important to give a number because the shift can happen so fast that if we don't give it a number, we think, oh, that I was never mad in the first place. Right? We have a target, we have a number, and then we'll start tapping. We start by tapping, and you can see me on the video, and I'll describe it for those of you Listening on your phone, we start by tapping on the side of the hand. It's called the karate chop point. It's yep. below the pinky on the outside of the hand. Whatever hand feels comfortable for you. And you're just tapping gently and repeat after me. And I'm going to use very general language. You want to focus in on your issue, what you're feeling, what you're thinking. So even though I'm holding on to all the stress in my body, you can just repeat that silently or out loud, whatever's comfortable for you. I choose to relax and feel safe now. And again, still on the side of the hand, we're going to do that two more times, just tuning in to that issue. Even though I have all the stress in my body, I choose to relax and feel safe now. And one more time, still on the side of the hand, focusing on that issue. Even though I'm holding on to this so tight, I choose to relax and feel safe now. And now we tap through the points. The first point is the eyebrow point inside of the eyebrow, right where the hair ends and it meets the nose. You can do one side, the other side, or both sides. The meridians run down both sides of the body. You're just tapping with two fingers gently, not counting, not worrying about getting it perfectly or right, just tuning into that issue, that stressful thing that you brought up, whether it was pain in your body or anxiety or overwhelm. What we're doing here, as we said earlier, is we're looking at that dirt. We're trying to activate the amygdala, activate that thing that is running in your mind. And now we move to the side of the eye. It's not at the temple, right next to the eye, on the bone, being present to these feelings. If you're by yourself and you can speak out loud, you can say just how you feel. Right? You can say, I'm angry at Joe. You can say, I'm stressed out about this presentation in two weeks. Speaking the truth of how you feel in this moment now. Now under the eye, on the bone. Again, 
being present to how you feel. Maybe it's an event. So maybe you're running a movie about what's happening, something someone said or did to you, something you're worried about. Run that movie. Be present to that feeling. Under the nose. Feeling the feelings in your body and just noticing what comes up as you focus on this. Notice what emotions, what, what events, what images under the mouth. Being present to the feeling. It's above the chin, below the lip, and that little crease there, tapping the two fingers. Running that movie, thinking those thoughts. And if you get distracted, that's okay. Just come back to your original issue, what it was you were working on. There's three points left for the collarbone point. Just feel for the two little bones of the collarbone. And you want to go down an inch, out to each side about an inch. You can tap with all ten fingers of both hands to make sure you get the point. And again, being present to that stressor. If there's pain in your body, just be with it now. And be with any emotions that come up. Now, underneath the armpit, three inches underneath the armpit, right on the bra line for women, either side of the body. Being present to those feelings to that stress, to that anxiety, to that overwhelm, to that anger. And the last point, top of the head, running that movie again. Being present to it. Now we'll do one more round and just repeat after me out loud or silently. It's safe to let this go. Side of the eye. Part of me doesn't want to let it go under the eye, but what if I could let it go now? Under the nose, I wonder why I'm holding on. Under the mouth, and I wonder if I could let this go. Collarbone, from every cell in my body. Under the arm, right now. Top of the head, right now. And you can gently stop tapping and take a deep breath in and just tune back in, tune back into that original issue and check that number. So it was an eight before, now it's a seven or a six or a five. We just want to notice what shifted and we want to notice what else came up, right? What other thoughts and ideas? Sometimes we're tapping on back pain and then we think about our boss. Maybe that's related in some way. Sometimes we're tapping about a presentation that we have to give in two weeks and we think about something that happened 20 years ago. So Michael, as you know, that's the tapping process. Mm -hmm. Just a few quick rounds, very generally. And as we go forward, we get more specific and we keep tapping as long as we need to to experience the relief that we're looking for. Thank you so much. Can you tell us what's the importance of the basic setup statement? And can you give us that again? Because yeah. I think it's important for people to really ingrain this one. No, for sure. So the setup statement, you know, tapping on the side of the hand, right? So the basic phrasing is even though, and we list our problem, even though I'm angry, even though I'm overwhelmed, even though I'm scared, even though I don't think I can do this, even though I don't believe in myself even though I have this pain in my back, right? Whatever the thing's happening. And then the second half of the setup statement is either the general one is I love, accept, and forgive myself. Mm -hmm. Recently, I've been doing, and you heard me do, I choose to relax and feel safe now. The reason I like that one is the love, accept, and forgive myself is powerful. As this reaches a wider, broader audience, um, there can be a little pushback to that, right? It's like, wait, why are we loving ourselves and accepting ourselves. And, you know, I believe this is a tool and it's happening that can reach millions and tens of millions of people and help them in their daily lives. So I'm changing the language a little bit with choose to relax and feel safe. And a lot of people, what I'm noticing too, Michael, is that that safety language, right? I choose mm -hmm. to relax and feel safe. They really connect to. Um, accepting yourself can feel very out there, like how do I accept myself? When do I reject myself? It's kind of like the safety thing, especially when we look at our body and we look at traumas and we look at the stressors, we can all seem to connect a little bit to like, hmm, what would it feel like to be safe, right? That brings in an element of relaxation that helps turn off that fight or flight response. Um, so that's why I've been playing with that language recently.
I, I like that. I'd, I'd never thought of it, but uh, I do a lot of self-work, self-love work and self-acceptance work with people. And I always share the story of when I start, first started saying, I love myself, um, I shattered a mirror one time and redecorated, as I call it, the bathroom, and another time um, sacrificed my favorite microwave um, and the linoleum floor. So, so saying I love myself or something to that effect can be a very loaded statement. Yeah, it can. And some people, sometimes it's too much for them. You know, if it is and you want to do that, you can tap right there, even <laughs> though I can't say I love myself. Like I've done that with people on stage Brilliant. where they're just like, oh. I just can't. Even though I can't say I love myself, that could be a core issue. And if you can't say you love yourself, that's something to tap on. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm using the general phrasing because as we get started, we don't necessarily want to trigger everybody so they <laughs> blow up microwaves in that instant. You know. Yeah. So let's let's go through your your book is brilliant. Let's go through some of the the some of the key themes. It's a 21 day process. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend everybody first get the book, but secondly follow through, follow through, follow through. This is not a book to read for a few days and go, oh yeah, I got it, and move on. Follow through the whole 21 day program. With that said, let's let's go at the start. What does it mean, peace or panic? Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, and that's how. And I so appreciate you saying follow follow through because that's what matters on these things, right? Getting to the end and uh, to that effect, we actually have a 21 day email sequence that you can sign up for. It's totally free, and we send you reminders. And here's what's cool about it: it's either every 21 days, or we can do every other day, or every mm -hmm. three days. Like the system is configured so you can select your pace. Because sometimes people are like, oh, my God, 21 days in a row. I can't do this. I'm busy. Great. Do it every other day, right? Make it 42 days, but follow the system. So anyway, that's available, and you can sign up for that right right when you get the book. URL. Uh, it's right at the front of the book. It's like the first page. It says go here in this box, and Perfect. then you can sign up for it. Um, I, can't, I can't give it all away, right? People will sign up <laughs> for reminders. I'm kidding. Um, peace or panic, you know? It's a little bit of what we did just now in that first tapping sequence. How do we move towards peace in our lives? You know, panic, I use the word panic not in like always a full-blown panic, though many of us are. The majority of people that I meet out there are walking around in some level of panic, right? Whether it be a 1 out of 10, like just mm -hmm. low-grade panic, or a 10 out of 10. It's the stress of the modern world. We have things coming at us all the time. Uh, especially in the last decade, there is no downtime. These phones, look, I love my iPhone. It's amazing. It's a flashlight. It's this, it's that. It takes amazing pictures. It's great to connect with people around the world. And it's perfectly designed to keep you on it and addicted. And it's information coming at you all the time. We're not used to this. We're not used to this level of engagement with the world. Uh, most of us, if we sit our, by ourselves quietly for five minutes, we're just bored beyond belief, right? We're just like, oh my God, what do, what do I do now? Um, so we've been conditioned. I think we have to recognize that, that mm -hmm. this is a different human experience than we might have had in the past. And with that comes just this low-grade panic, right? We're just like that stress, that overwhelm, the things coming at us. What I'm proposing, when you do this tapping, you start choosing peace. You start bringing down these feelings of panic in the body and the stress and the overwhelm. And you start getting to what we talked about in the beginning of the, of the conversation with Tony Robbins stuff, getting to control your life, right? To a place where like panic just doesn't happen to you. You have a choice. You have a choice when you wake up in the morning, if you're doing this work to feel that peace. And then when you start opening that door, when you start doing the tapping and that's what I love about it, you get that positive reinforcement, right? Like you, you do, there's some people reading the book right now. We have a Facebook group for it. So they're like giving feedback every day. And after day one, you see that people have opened a door that their mind's going, huh, I have a tool to reduce the panic and I can start to choose peace. Mm -hmm. Without that tool, it can be difficult and scary, right? Yeah, I'd like to choose peace, but like I'm freaking out, you know? This is a way to turn off short circuit, like you said earlier, turn off that brain and these patterns of panic. We are running patterns of panic. We're good at it. Our brains are used to doing it. We're running on autopilot. On day one of this program, we short circuit it. We we hit that pause button and then that P starts growing and growing. Woohoo! 
So I'm a huge proponent of routine, something mm. that you talk about later in the book, but maybe we can even jump in right here. Maybe the importance of taking five minutes each morning to look for that panic and go after it right away. Yeah. I mean, it's everything, right? I, I, I've thought about this a lot because I'm working on different programs and you know how to deliver them to people and how to give them the best results. And this book, besides the tapping itself, I did a lot of thinking about the process, right? So, you know, I had a choice. I didn't have to make it a 21 day process and I have to do the, the Facebook group and the email reminders and all these things, but I did them all. And even in the book itself, you'll notice that if you look at it closely, I spaced out the text differently than most books because most books are hard to read and they're exhausting. And I want this to be something you can actually get through in the morning or at night. You know, it, Not only did you space it out, which is fun, but then you gave pep talks. You put yeah. it in a different yeah. shade of, of gray and you're like, guys, look at where you've gone, like, how we far need you've this, come. Though, right? I mean, I, yeah. and, and you know, I noticed that when I, I had some early readers of the book that whenever I said anything positive and encouraging to them, it really filled them up. And it made me think, boy, we all need this, right? This is why, <laughs> this is why Inspire Nation exists. Like we need this. So yeah, there's peck talks in the book and it's all to establish that routine, that pattern. So my early point was if I had a choice and someone reading the book said to me, what should I do? Should I tap for an hour today, right? Mm -hmm. Like just do one hour tapping today and then again a week later, or should I tap for five minutes for the next seven days? I would say do five minutes the next seven days. I want you to establish that routine. I want you to get those victories in, right? Like that's what's great about that five minutes. We tend to want things in our life. We want to create change. So we go, okay, I'm into tapping or I'm into meditation or I'm into exercising. I'm going to do an hour a day for the next 21 days and I'm just going to crush this thing, right? And yeah, you're psyched for three days and then your willpower gives up and you chalk it up as another failure or you forget about it. Do five minutes, do it in the morning or do it before bed and have a victory and walk away going, wow, I feel better now than I did earlier. This is sustainable. This is doable. I can make this a part of my life and then build from there. That, that gets to the image behind me and a very gentle way to start chipping away at it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we were talking about it before. It's funny that you have Everest behind you because I was doing um, another interview with my sister today. I talked about climbing Mount Everest in the interview and we were talking about goal setting and how, you know, it's certainly a cultural thing where we, we set a goal and it's gotta be tough. And the only way we're going to get there is we're going to power through it. And, you know, we see these people out there who are just, oh, they're they have the best willpower. They're powering through. Those people do exist. I mean, there are people who are just animals and I say that in a positive way, right? They're up at 5 AM and they're just like, boom, 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 boom. And they're scheduled and they're regimented and they're checking off their to-do list and they're climbing Mount Everest, right? They're the ones with all the gear making it happen. One of the biggest transfer and like Tony Robbins is one of those guys, right? Like yeah. he is, I've sat with him. He's just one of those. He is on it. One of the biggest transformations in my life was when I recognized that I would never be Tony Robbins Mm -hmm. that I didn't want to be Tony Robbins, not because I don't love the guy and he's amazing, but he's not Nick Ortner, right? He's not me. But we tend to do this. We tend to aspire to something, which is great. How do we aspire to climb Mount Everest behind you in our way? I'm not Tony. I'm not regimented. I'm not a big fan of to-do lists. Like I flow through my day. Mm -hmm. I think that my productivity speaks for itself. And the work I'm doing speaks for itself. But it was when I found that inner peace about like, this is who I want to be in the world. I don't have to show up the way that someone on Instagram shows up or Facebook shows up or the author that I just read shows up. I can create my combination of who I want to be in the world. Awesome. And there's, there's a word that I think describes you. Hopefully you would agree with this. Um, that's, that's, um, more about where your priorities lie, which is a Hawaiian word, Ohana. Mm. family, family yeah. becoming. And so not going out there at breakneck speed where you're not able to see or be with your family, but that's a huge part of it. It is. I know it's such a big part of my life. You know, my family, both in the tapping solution, because literally every direct family member, you know, my sister wrote a book, my brother wrote a book. Uh, my mom works for the foundation. My dad works for the company. All Immediate family members now work for the Tapping Solution, you know, which is amazing. And uh, a big reason why I am where I am today is their support. And then my wife, Brennan, daughter, June. You know, it's like I 
uh, right now what you're seeing behind me is this barn that I built in the backyard. This is my yeah. home office. I needed a separate building because with a two-year-old daughter, it's this would be impossible right now, right? Uh, we'd, we'd have a lot of interruptions and a lot of knocking mm -hmm. and um, smiling and crying. So this is the life that I've chosen to create for myself. And I know when I get off of that foundation, which happens, right, where it's like, and it can certainly happen during a book launch and it can happen when there's opportunities to travel. I feel off and it's not it at my center. The more I focus on that, on who I want to be with the world, the more I see my greatest work and my greatest self come out. So it's like, it's not like you're giving anything up, right? People, you just determine how it is that you want to show up in the world. Beautiful. On that note, then I've got to ask the importance of eight hugs a day. Oh boy. You know, and people get like overwhelmed about eight hugs a day because they're like, ah, I don't know if I'm getting eight hugs a day. Like eight hugs a day is aspirational. It also is really talking about connection and pets mm -hmm. do count. Like dogs and cats are amazing for <laughs> hugs and cuddles and babies count. And, you know, I even talk in the book and the right Facebook community can count. It's about connection. Mm -hmm. How do we connect with each other? How do we support each other? Um, one of the things that I've seen as most powerful in our programs, and I mentioned there's a Facebook group for this book, is that people are connecting with each other and it's that tribe. They're talking to each other. It's great. These are closed groups. So you, no one else, your family members don't have to see anything. And you can say, I'm really struggling here and I'm stuck there. And I've seen time and again where people felt alone. You know, day three is about loneliness. Like so many people feel alone that the challenges they're going through, that they're the only ones. And when they post about it, when they open up, when they're vulnerable and they hear that someone else is going through that, mm -hmm. it's like, boy, did that task become harder, become much easier than it was before. Did that challenge become, okay, maybe this is something that I can do. It's like climbing Mount Everest alone. Look, if you and I had the choice of going alone or going with each other, we'd go with each other, right? That's always oh, the man. choice, always the choice that a human being will make. So the point of that chapter is recognizing these feelings of loneliness. Where do they show up in your life and how can you do something to change that. You know, the other thing I've heard about that is that so many people feel lonely in crowds and in situations where it's like, oh, I'm at a party and I feel lonely. Like, what's that about? You know, so acknowledging that and then knowing how important that eight hugs a day, the oxytocin, that feeling of connection is to our real thriving. Beautiful. And, and since we're talking about thriving and kind of how even the brain is wired, I'm going to jump back to day two. We've had Rick on the show, Rick Hansen on the show. I love And, Rick. and talked about this. He is amazing. Yep. But, but he didn't actually go into Grog and Thor. Yeah, because I made Grog and Thor up. Those are my, those are my little, little guys. They rock. Cer yeah, certainly based on, on Rick's work. And I mentioned him. He's a, he's a friend and I mentioned him in every book because his work is amazing. So Grog and Thor, you know, the story of Grog and Thor, and uh, I'll tell it now because I think it's a nice image for people, all right? Beautiful. So day two, negativity hardwired, a look at the primitive brain. Grog and Thor sit perched at the edge of their cave. You know Grog, your great, 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 great ancestor. You'd recognize him. You both have the same nose. He's waiting patiently but alertly with his friend Thor. They've been hearing some saber-toothed tiger sounds not too far from their lovely abode. Grog says, Ugh, 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 ah, frumf. Oh, you don't speak caveman? I'll translate for you the rest of the way. I'm pretty nervous about that tiger. It sounds like a big one, and it's coming our way. Thor, twiddling his thumbs, half meditating in a lotus position, says, Brother man, there is nothing to worry about. The sun is shining We've discovered fire and some basic tools, and this cave is luxurious. Bask in gratitude and the joy of life. Grog looks around nervously. It sounds like the tiger's getting closer and quickly. Thor, I'm going to higher ground. We're tiger meat in this spot, and I don't think the two of us are going to be able to handle this guy. Grog, you are so negative. Always talking about what could go wrong. Always moving to higher ground or worrying about this or that. You know, you're just not going to attract what you want in your life with that attitude. Sensing the tiger's approach, Grog scampers away at a full sprint toward higher ground where the tiger can't climb. He makes one last desperate call to Thor. Please run. Thor continues his peaceful meditation. 
and is swallowed almost whole by one of the largest saber-toothed tigers to roam the ancient world. Well, at least Thor seemed happy until his untimely death. Grog lives, and with him, his DNA. And partly because of his, and partly because of his negative, pessimistic, cautious attitude, he survives. Thor has vanished along with his happy genes. And so it goes again and again and again and again. And thus the human brain evolved, literally clinging for dear life to something we call the negativity bias. So that is what that is our ancient ancestor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we've evolved like Grog, but now in the modern modern world we want to be like Thor. Uh, at, at least minus buses and other things that we really do need to look out for. 100%. Minus legitimate fight or flight dangerous life situations. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we make that distinction? So how do we use tapping to help better regulate the Grog Thor system? Yeah, great question. So, and it's something that people ask when it's like, let's say they have a snake phobia, right? Mm -hmm. An out and out snake phobia. And if it's a real snake phobia, we, we showed this in our Tapping Solution documentary film that was filmed almost a decade ago now. And we show, we, we got a snake from the pet store. We had 10 people that we brought together from around the country with all different challenges. And we bought a snake and brought the snake into the room to see if we could tap on snake phobias and what would people would feel. And most people, we didn't know who would have what. So most people were fine. And you could see Jackie, who 30 feet away started sweating. Right now, this is not a big snake, and it was in its you know little snake house, so it, it was safe. Everyone else said, "Yeah, there's a there's a pet snake over there." I, I, I've got to ask. I, 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 my yeah. apologies. What was the snake's name? You know what? The snake was named afterwards because one of our volunteers kept the snake and had it for a long time. <laughs> and my God, it's been so long. We had two things. We had a rat. We had yep. George the rat, and then we had a snake. Oh, I know George the rat. Maybe uh, Sam the snake. Sam the snake, <laughs> right? So she started sweating. Now, to me, that's a great example of when, you know, regulating that system. Mm -hmm. Everyone else in the room was fine. Everyone else knew that there was no danger. If a python had come into the room, if something, if a cobra, whatever the most dangerous snake is, had come into the room, we would have all been, rightly so, scared. We, amygdala would have fired. We would have done something. This yeah. is a safe snake. And she started sweating. So we did the tapping and you could see video of it. It's pretty cool because eventually for the first time in her life, she picks up the snake and she's holding it and she's looking at it and she's fine with it because it was a pet snake that wasn't dangerous. The reason I tell that story is that applies to all parts of our lives, right? Where we have, if, if there's a bus, yes, we're going to remain dangerous. It's going to be dangerous. We're not going to walk out in front of buses. We can tap until we're blue in the face, even though I'm scared of walking out in front of a bus. <laughs> We're still going to walk out in front of a bus. It's these imagined fears. It's these overlays of experiences that we've had in the past. It's when we got up in front of the class in fifth grade to speak and we stumbled on a word and we decided in that moment, I'm never speaking in public because I'm not good at it or I'm going to get laughed at or it's dangerous. Those are the places where we can, with the tapping, as you said earlier, short circuit that fear. Take it off because it doesn't belong there. It's not your natural you. Beautiful. From there, can you tell us what's the importance of small victories and then positive tapping? Yeah. So, you know, small victories is in large part what we were talking about before with routine. I think they come together where if you establish a routine and you keep it doable, then you can start reinforcing. You know, too many of us are walking around thinking that we didn't do this and we didn't do that. And again, that's the negativity bias at play. Like we're looking for the places that are wrong. When we have the small victories, we can start to reinforce that and, and really rebuild ourselves. Like for a lot of people, it's about rebuilding that confidence, rebuilding that self-esteem, rebuilding that joy, whether it was taken away in childhood because it was a difficult childhood or adulthood where it's like, you know, the last 20 years have been rough and I need more juice back, right? So mm -hmm. these small victories, that's how you're going to get that juice back. You're not going to get it. It's not going to be like you climb Mount Everest. And now you're just finally happy and everything is fixed. You're going to get that juice back because every step that you take up the mountain, you say, I'm doing it. I'm getting better. I'm getting stronger. And I'm proud of myself after the first step, not only when I get to the top. And then the positive tapping is to amplify these emotions, right? So, you know, if you wake up in the morning feeling great, great. 
I'm feeling so positive and I envision a wonderful day and I relax my body and I heal more, boom, 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 just anchoring that in. I think it's just a great anchor. And what happens too when you do the positive tapping on a consistent basis, then when you're in that negative space, you're mm-hmm. setting yourself up that, okay, I can be in a meeting and I can tap underneath the table on my on the side of the hand on the karate chop point and I've conditioned myself to let go and to get back to that positive state. Beautiful. So let's go from anchoring to a very similar word, angering. <laughs> How do mm-hmm. we let go of anger? Yeah, such a great question. And you know, anger is one of those tricky ones that if we don't have a tool to release it, first off, you know, usually with anger, if you ask someone like, why are you angry? They'll tell you a story. With that story will be a justification, right? Mm-hmm. We we'll, we're generally believe that we're right when we're angry. If we didn't think we were right, we wouldn't feel anger. We would feel guilt or shame or something like that. So we're holding on to it. And the challenging thing with anger, again, without a tool, is if we go back to that amygdala, that fight or flight response, that anger is is in large part there to keep you safe. So, Michael, you say something offensive to me. I get angry. I decide, err. And I do that because I don't want you to say that anymore, right? It's a way of like standing up for myself. This behavior, I, sh- I, can't, I shouldn't tolerate it. So I'm angry. Obviously, this happens with our family members, you know, a lot with colleagues. So it makes sense that it's there. And the body, especially as it runs that pattern a lot, is not going to release it easily. It's going to say no. Because you know what? If I forgive you and I say, all right, I want to be forgiving – he said that thing, it was so rude, but I'm just going to be forgiving and say, I love you. The body, the body's instinct is to say no, because if I do that, it's going to happen again. Like, I've got to make my stand here. When we acknowledge our anger, when we process it through tapping, a couple things happen. First off, we have clarity as to what the right thing to do is. So do I let it go? Is it, we'll also have clarity like, oh my gosh, I don't know why I was angry, because clearly that was just like a joke or he didn't mean it or boy, it's so silly. Or we, re- we realize, you know what? I do need to say something because this person said this thing to me six times already and it hurts my feelings. So now I'm going to say something. The difference is you're going to say it from that place of peace and you're going to mm-hmm. say, Joan, you know, when you said that it really hurt my feelings and I, you probably didn't mean it, but I just, I just had to speak my truth about it as opposed to Joan, you are an awful person and you're hurting my feelings and blah, blah, blah. Because what happens then, right? Anger breeds more anger. And then Joan says, no, I'm not an awful person. And we get nowhere. So it's not about, you know, it feels like, especially in the sort of the self-help world and when we're looking at loving ourselves and forgiveness that we tend to think, okay, I will never be angry again. There, no anger is ever justified for any amount of time whatsoever. And I don't think that's the case. Um, I think we can process it much more quickly. I think we can use it to power us forward. Oh, you know, I'm angry that this happened. I'm going to tap through it. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to see the lesson, but I'm going to use that energy to go in a positive direction. Beautiful. And there's, there's a term, I think it's Rick Hansen's term as well. And, and your ta- and tapping helps tremendously with this, which is overcoming an amygdala hijacking. Mm, the absolutely. moment you get angry and you go stupid. And you go stupid, right? I mean, you literally go stupid. And we've all ex- all experienced it. And then you were like an hour later or sadly for some people a week or a month or a year later, they've been holding on for so long. They just go, what was that? Like, I, that wasn't me, you know, that wasn't who I am. So let's go from there on the same topic real briefly is you have four very powerful words that people can work on tapping on. I refuse to forgive. Mm. Yeah. And that's part of that anger tapping, right? So like that, that instance and, and I refuse to forgive generally points to things in the past, right? Mm-hmm. Like that they've gone on for a while. Usually something that happened yesterday, you're not like, I refuse to forgive. Sometimes you can be, but that, that real entrenched energy, we can just tap on that, acknowledge it, even though I refuse to forgive them, like speaking the truth on it, right? Even though I refuse to forgive them, I choose to relax now, even though they really don't deserve my forgiveness. They are total A, you know, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) Say whatever you feel about them. Speak your anger, truth, tapping. I refuse to forgive them. There's no way they don't deserve it. If I forgive them, I'm condoning their behavior. All that, all that, all that. Do it and then watch what happens. And it's what is magical to me about tapping. 
You don't have to force your way to that forgiveness. You don't have to say, okay, fine, I will forgive Joan because it's the right thing to do, and grr, or I'm going to swallow it down and I'm going to carry it in my stomach and my gut, my intestines for the rest of my life because I swallow down my anger. No, we're speaking truth to it, and then you go, then you just allow yourself to see what happens. Oh, you know what? Maybe I want to forgive them. Maybe it's time. Maybe I didn't see this. And, and that amygdala gets unhijacked. Your brain is back online. You can make better mm-hmm. decisions. Awesome. It's a woohoo. You, you, you're, you're in that moment. You're also rewiring yourself for you, you're, you're putting, I call it a monkey in the wheel, poor monkey, but, but you're stopping the hijacking and you're starting to replace it with more kindness and compassion yeah. because you breathed a pause into the situation. 100%. I love that you say that, that kindness and compassion, it just comes up naturally, right? It's just like, oh my gosh, I'm, it's there. It's underneath all of it, right? All these states that we want, the kindness, the mm-hmm. compassion, the love, the energy, the inspiration, it's all there. It's not that we have to bring those in. They're underneath all the other stuff that's getting in the way. Beautiful. So if, if I was to take my coaching hat and I was to give it to you today, I want people to leave with a homework assignment. Mm-hmm. What one homework assignment would you give people to start working on this themselves? Yeah. So great question. I would say however you do it. And obviously, you know, I have the new book, which I think you'll really enjoy. Our website, thetappingsolution.com has tons of free resources. Take five minutes. You know, you had a little bit of experience today. Hopefully you, you were able to tap. Maybe you were in the car, so you couldn't. Take five minutes and just have an experience. And as you have that experience, make the point of it to be, do I feel better five minutes later than I did five minutes ago? Did it open a door? Am I taking a deeper breath? Is the pain a little lower than it was before? Do I feel a little bit more inspired? If that's the case, if that five minute investment paid off, right? That's mm-hmm. a pretty huge payoff in that five minute investment. Then just ask yourself, what if I could do this for five minutes a day for the next week, month, year? As we talked about at length, it's these daily habits that build up. As you mentioned, as I know with every cell in my body, there's no more powerful tool than tapping to create the things that you want in your life. And it's really whatever it is. We've got to turn off that amygdala. We've got to take our power back. We have to, you know, find ourselves in a place where we can lower the stress, lower the anxiety. And from that place, we can show up as our greatest selves. Woohoo! It, it's, it's really a matter of going hunting, looking for all this stuff, ferreting it out. You really epitomize one of the expressions that I have. I was sharing it before the show. Kind, gentle, easy, good. You're trying to make everything kinder on mm-hmm. yourself and thereby kinder on everybody else. One of the last ones I want to touch on is you don't like to force through things. For instance, you were writing and you were struggling to make it more pleasant. Mm. How, how are you kinder on yourself there? Yeah. I am, you know, I like to say I am like a, and I always have been a great quitter. Like I remember freshman year soccer, there was a horrible coach. It's just a, not a nice gentleman. He made the, I played soccer my whole life. I loved it. He made the experience miserable. I quit. And I was proud of myself on that. And I, they changed coaches. I came back and played the next year. I knew looking at those next three months of my life with this coach and the, the energy around there and the attitude and the experience that it was going to be an unhappy experience. Now, most people would say, oh, you know, you're a good soccer player. I mean, senior year, I was the captain of the team. So it was like I was on a trajectory for something good. Mm-hmm. But I have never been willing to trade that momentary pain for that supposed, you know, future outcome. It was like, no, I'm miserable here. If, does that mean I won't play soccer all four years? If that's the case, does that mean I'm not miserable for four years? Okay, <laughs> I just made a good decision, right? Yeah. So – Whatever it is I'm doing in my life, if I'm writing the book and it's miserable. Now, I don't mean I don't face challenges. I don't mean that I don't look to step out of my comfort zone. Mm-hmm. But we, what I look to do is how do I push a little further outside of my comfort zone that says, okay, yeah, this takes a little energy. I'm going to tap because I'm procrastinating. I'm going to buckle down. But you don't want it to be a leap, right? And, and I love that Mount Everest is, is behind us, behind you today because – we are looking around at our lives and making it like a Mount Everest, like, and thinking, oh my God, it's so big and it's going to be cold and windy and miserable. And if it's not miserable, I don't deserve it. That's the other thing that I have worked in the last 20 years 
to rewire my brain to go, you know what, if, if something was fun and effortless, it's still a victory. Like this conversation right now, right? I've had a wonderful time, no effort. Like we're just chatting, you're a mm -hmm. wonderful interviewer, I love tapping. And in the past, I could get off of this thing and we're reaching people around the world, like it's a victory all around. But because I had so much fun, I could get off of it and not think that I had done something because it wasn't difficult. Right? Does that Good make point. sense? That it's like, and we set ourselves up in all these places in our lives that says that we have to suffer, that it has to be difficult, that, well, if it was a six and a half hour podcast and I made it through, <laughs> then at the end I could go, boy, that was hard and I deserve whatever I get. Right? So I look to the places in my life where I can add more pleasure, the places where I can make decisions about things that I want to do. And if there are things that are slightly less pleasurable or, you know, there's things that we have to do, whether it's our taxes, well, do them with some good music on or, you know, get your great cup of tea with, you know, good slogans on there. Like do the things that just add to that experience so you can enjoy it. And, you know, and truly, just like I quit my freshman soccer team, like, Look around your life, and if there are places where you think, I'm suffering now because something is going to pay off later, look again. Look again to whether you can change your current experience or do something else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. On that note, what advice would you give parents to help their kids maybe through tapping today? Oh, boy. That is such a huge, big topic. Um, so a couple of resources. One um, – in hopefully by January of 2018, January, February, yeah. March, somewhere in that space, I will have published a whole book on tapping for parents and kids. Um, it's a huge book where it has case studies on how to do it for everything. Uh, the first half is for parents to tap mm -hmm. and on their experience. The second half is all case studies on how to use it for your kids. And I especially plug it because I'm donating 100% of my royalties on that book in perpetuity for as long as the book lives to the Tapping Solution Foundation where I don't make a penny. So I'm, I won't make a penny from the book. I hope it'll help parents around the world. I know that it will. And that's a great resource to go deep when that comes out. So just, you know, look out for that. And then, um, and then we also have a kid's book for tapping. Uh, my brother wrote a, ki a kid's book called Gorilla Thumps and Bear Hugs, mm -hmm. right over there, and um, beautifully illustrated. It's a story and it takes kids through the tapping points in a really fun way. So, you know, you have the wolf chin point and the lion cry point and the gorilla thump point. So it uses animals to teach kids the points. I found some adults have actually found it really useful to learn the points. They're like, oh, good, I can remember the monkey point, but I can't remember the top of the head. Um, so that's a great resource to, to just read to your kids at night and help them to start to calm that amygdala, release that stress, release that anxiety. And then, as I mentioned in the first half of the book that's coming out, as a parent, the best thing that you can do, the first thing you can do, release and reduce your stress, your panic, your anxiety, especially about parenting and especially about your kids, and watch how they transform. We think that it's like, okay, what is the thing that is going to fix Johnny? Mm -hmm. And I've seen time and again when I work with a parent, a group of parents, and, I, and they say, mm -hmm. You know, even though I'm so anxious about Johnny and I'm so stressed out and I just don't believe he can do this. And they just acknowledge the truth of how they feel about it and what they're bringing situ the, to the situation. All of a sudden, Johnny starts changing and their experience of it starts changing and they become more resourceful and they think about other ideas and things to do. So for parents, it's so powerful. Use it on yourself first and then explore the other resources. Awesome. Woohoo! What, what's a big book of hugs? Big Book of Hugs is, uh, there's no tapping in it. There's just hugs. Um, it's a kid's book that I wrote when my daughter June was born. Um, I've got another kid's book coming out in May of 2018. And it's just a happy story of Barkley the bear. And he learns all the different kinds of hugs that you can have in the forest. So it was my way of, uh, you know, just a creative endeavor. I definitely will do more kid's books. Like I said, my brother did the kid's books for tapping. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just a little piece of joy to put out in the world. Awesome. And speaking of a little piece of joy, where can people go to find your beautiful books and to find out more? Anywhere where books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore. If you have a local bookstore, pick it up there or order it there. So we support these 
amazing little locations that um, we're sadly losing. And uh, it's also available on Kindle. And uh, yeah, go, go enjoy it and tap. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Nick, I have really, truly enjoyed this interview. The work you're doing, but also this is our first time speaking together. The philosophy and the for lack of another term, the gentleness, not the young, got to grind through it approach. You bring balance to it. But I love what you're doing and the approach you're sharing with the world. Thank you. That, that really means a lot. Um, it's certainly what I'm going for. So it's nice that it's communicated and working. Uh, it, it's working great. So any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? No, just tap, find a way again, whether it be, you know, the resources we have available or somewhere else. I don't care how you do it and where you do it. You don't have to do it with my stuff. This is a life changing tool and don't miss it. Use it and then share it with your friends and family. I mean, that's what's so powerful about it. It's so easy to share. And, you know, we're always looking around at the people we love and going, boy, I wish I could help them. Uh, this is a great way to do it. Thank you so much, Nick. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get manifesting your greatest self, and begin tapping today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. That was great. I really, really enjoyed it. I'm glad we were able to connect. It would have been sad if we hadn't had this great experience. So it was perfect that it was, it was kind of, I'm going beforehand, hmm. Maybe I should be tapping on this right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>